Hello from everyone tuning in online. We're here at the Adorama event space in New York City. We are waiting one minute <laughs> before actually starting, but thank you guys for tuning in online. You don't have to wait, Sal. <laughs> Should I just go? You want me to go? <laughs> Why be precise, right? Why be on time? Hey, Brad, thank you for tuning in. I'm going to go through a brief presentation of the new season of Through the Lens that is going live on Friday. And after that, open to questions about filmmaking, video, whatever you want. We can even talk about movies, <laughs> John Wick, the new Netflix shows, everything. <laughs> okay. I'll go, let's do it. Okay, uh, hello everyone, I'm Sal Dalia. I'm the senior video producer here at Dorama. I've been working here for 10 years. I actually started right there in the sales, video sales in the corner. <laughs> um, and then little by little, I built kind of like, you know, the department and actually the content department that creates, you know, all the videos on Adorama TV, now we are, you know, three people actually working in the video production here at the company, plus social media and other people working at Adorama. But everything started right there in that corner with a, you know, an iMac <laughs> and a shelf <laughs> and a dream. <laughs> um, and, and now here we are uh, in, tw in 2015, I actually started, um, I pitched an idea here at Adorama because we were only doing video reviews, uh, you know, and those kind of videos. And I was kind of like, you know, why not do actual original content? Why not do documentary, something that builds community? And of course, those were the years where kind of like Instagram was on the rise, was becoming, you know, bigger and bigger. And, you know, as an artist, photographer myself, you know, I'm sure that all of you have a photo that for you is the best. It's like the best photo that I ever took, right? For others, like, oh, that's a nice photo, right? But why is great that photo? Because probably there is like a story behind it. Or the moment you took that photo, uh, you know, it was meaningful for you, right? So the only way for people to know about that is to tell that story, right? Sometimes people in the description of their photo would write how they took that photo, what's the behind the seat of that photo, right? Um, but often they don't because you know, photographers especially, they are shy, most of them, right? They don't want to be in front of the camera, like me right now. <laughs> but they have to do it, right? It's, it's actually useful to tell your story and to let people in even more into your creative process and all that stuff. So that's when I had the idea, you know, as a filmmaker, why don't I do, and you know, I work for Adorama, it's a camera store, why don't I actually tell the stories of the people behind Instagram as accounts, right? So. Uh, everybody, you know, follow this person that has one million follower, but we don't know much about them. You know, at that time there was no stories, so there was no way for like, you know, the photographers to kind of like, you know, tell their own stories uh, besides the photos. So that's when I decided, okay, you know what, I'm gonna go meet these people and shoot like a short documentary of their life and their creative process and how they do it, right? This was 2015. So of course I started with like, zero budget <laughs> and you know it was only New York so only photographers here in New York and and that was a hit it went incredibly well the community responded very well people wanted more people wanted to see you know to know more about stories and especially not just New York they wanted to know stories about people everywhere in the country and why not the rest of the world right and that's you know 2015 season one New York 2016 season two the US and I started traveling around I went to Hong Kong, Japan, Cuba, uh, Europe. So, you know, that, this series gave me the opportunity to meet some of the best photographers, you know, online in the world, uh, travel, uh, grow our community here at Dorama. And, and now we are here today, you know, in our event space with a nice big channel, with a lot of great content, a lot of great, you know, contributors working for Adorama. So that's, you know, it's an important piece, not just for me, but I guess also for like, you know, the content team here at Dorama and, and YouTube. And Friday is season eight. 
So you, uh, Through the Lens took kind of like a break because of the pandemic. Uh, so the last season was actually right before the pandemic. So it took kind of like a break for a while. I, I didn't even know if I you know, <laughs> wanted to kind of like keep going in a way. Um, but during the pandemic, especially with the rise of kind of like, you know, the Web3, NFTs and AI, 3D arts, like all that, I felt kind of like the need of like you know, telling more stories of, you know, artists and creative people um, because everything is changing, you know, especially our job, filmmaker, photographers, everything is changing. So are we adapting? Are we just like giving up? Uh, like those are kind of like the question that I also ask to all the people that are featured uh, in this new season. Um, and that's why I think it's important. That's why I call it into the future. Uh, and it's why it's different from the others, right? So let's, let's start with a presentation. So as I just told you, through the lens now, we have 110 videos on uh, Adorama TV that you can watch. So 110 episodes. Uh, 105 artists, 105 photographers, filmmakers, artists. I'm pretty sure that if you never watch the show, you can probably find someone that you follow already on Instagram that you liked maybe for years, and you can actually get to know them a, li a little bit about you know their story, their life. Um, and sometimes for real, like you get to know people and appreciate their art so more. And like you know, like everything changes, right? Because even a photo of a landscape can take so many different meanings if you know that that person is a cancer survivor, right? So it maybe was doing a different job before than after he's surviving cancer. So it's like, you know what? I'm gonna spend the rest of my life just traveling and shooting beautiful landscape because that's what I really wanna do and that's what gives you know, meaning to my life. So then you look at, at, their, you know, at their photo in a different way because you know their story, right? So that kind of like the meaning behind, you know, through the lens. Um, so now, yes, you see season eight into the future. We also actually also shot two special season, I call it, uh, through the lens Cuba and through the lens Nigeria. Um, Cuba, we actually brought six photographers, uh, two uh, pretty big photographers in the, in the community. We brought them to Cuba to kind of like get to know the country more besides what we all know through, you know, online or to press or to other stuff. So the way that we visit the Cuba or with local people and through the eyes of the photographers, I think gives a different perspective of the country. Um, and then through the lens Nigeria, in the time that I decided to uh, stop doing through the lens, uh, one of the fans of the show from Nigeria asked me like, you know, why can't you come to Nigeria? Right? I would love to, <laughs> you know, there's no budget and Nigeria is not, you know, <laughs> very close. So I, I would love to do that. And he decided to kind of like pitch me a pilot of, you know, like copying kind of like the style of the show. And I liked it so much. So I asked for like a little bit of budget. He says like, you know what, you shoot it. Like you give me five episodes and that's it. Through the lens of Nigeria, I didn't shoot it. Was actually a very young filmmaker that, you know, from Nigeria that submit all the episodes. And I'm very proud of kind of like, you know, that we did that as well. Um, and that's actually, you know, for anybody that is watching, <laughs> whatever you are that in the world, if you want to do something like that, please send, you know, your pilot or your ideas, and maybe we'll make it happen. <laughs> I can't come, you know, <laughs> I can't be sure, but, you know, if the budget is doable, we'll make it happen. Okay, so this is season eight, Into the Future. So I had to pick, based on budget and time, different artists and people that kind of like balanced out um, the, the story that I wanted to tell this season. So it's a mix of photographer, 3D artists, filmmakers, photographers that do AI, um, and more traditional photographers that do self-portraits with creativity, right? So it's a mix of different people. Um, maybe you know some of them already, uh, or maybe you probably you know, know their work, even though you don't know their story. And I think it's a very good, solid lineup. You know, the first episode is gonna be G-Monk, um, Brad Mankovitz. He, he probably don't know him directly. He's an amazing visual artist, but he also, he did some of the greatest movies, visual effects movies that you probably ever watched, like Tron Legacy, uh, he, he worked on the last Top Gun. Uh, he does a lot of like incredible visual effects, but he's also an artist and a photographer. 
So um, he's, he's, he's a genius. <laughs> he's a genius. Like you know, even like the interview with him was 40 minutes of like crazy amount of ideas that I had to kind of like compress in seven minutes of uh, of episode. So it's gonna be a very good, solid first episode. Then I have Summer Wagner. Wagner, she's a an amazing photographer um, that during pandemic kind of like decided to, um, you know, go into nature, you know, by herself and shoot this like very hairy, dark, gothic self portraits uh, that she does, you know, it looks so natural the way that she works. And then you look at the photo and they're incredible. You know, it's like you're looking like, you know, a ghost. It's like romantic, but dark at the same time. Um, and beautiful, beautiful work. Uh, Michael Christopher Brown, very famous na National Geographic photographer, uh, old school. So he started with like film photography, right? Uh, he did war photography for many years, like surviving crazy stories that are also in the episodes. But then actually lately, he was uh, on many articles because he did this um, collection of photos made in AI about, um, people emigrating from Cuba in the 60s. So his idea behind it is that we don't have any photos, any documentation of those moments, like of those people trying to like, you know, swim sometimes or creating like, you know, boats to try to go to, you know, to, to Florida from, from Cuba. Uh, so as a photojournalist, as it is, he said, you know what? I'm gonna talk to people, do like the, the work of a journalist, right? and try to create visually, thanks to AI, photos that nobody was, able, was ever able to took, right? And create something because the photo is so much stronger sometimes than just like, you know, reading a story. Uh, and that's what kind of like the, the job of photojournalist is, right? Like to just put in your face something that that's, you know, that's history, right? That's what's happening right now. So he did that thing with this, you know, the, the stories of these people from Cuba. And, and of course, it was very, you know, there was a lot of speculation around it, and you know, people were like, that's not real photography, uh, you know, that's fake, that's AI, which is true. And he said it, like in the episodes we talk about that. Like that's, that's kind of like an artist, like a painter, uh, you know, trying to make something that is personal about that story, right? It's not something that is real. He says like, this is not photography, this is AI. But it's still a very good, useful tool to tell stories that, you know, I wasn't able to tell before, basically. So that's a very interesting episode. Gilmar, uh, Nikon ambassador, her self-portraits are very, you know, fantasy, uh, colorful, and I really love, she has a great personal story, uh, which I'm not gonna, you know, give you any. She's in the chat. Yeah. Oh, hi, Gilmar. <laughs> she has a beautiful personal story that I'm not gonna, you know, spoil anything because you have to watch the episode. Uh, but it's, um, it's something that I actually also touched in the past that I think it's beautiful. It's when photography becomes, um, it's also for uh, mental health. It's also like something that can save your life, right? So I met people before that had, you know, similar uh, story. I'm not gonna go into details right now, but you're gonna watch the episode. But, you know, it's beautiful to, I think, to know when photography goes behind just like being a pretty photo, right? It's something that it's like, you know, it's deep and, and it's beautiful. Um, uh, Euphoria, uh, Canadian um, 3D artist, uh, amazing 3D artist. He did a lot of stuff with like famous DJ and music. Um, but I really love his work, not just for the colors and the 3D art, but also because he used like motion capture. So in the episode, you will see him actually putting like the suit and then kind of like, you know, moving the, the, uh, his 3D object to do actually animation, like actually animates his, his 3D characters, which is, I think it's very fun to, to learn. And it's gonna be, in my opinion, the future for many, like, you know, for both video and photography. It's gonna change a lot of things in visual arts. Uh, last one, uh, Nikola Kristic is a very famous uh, filmmaker videographer. Uh, even though he's very young, he actually has an account on Instagram called Filmmakers that has like millions of followers. Uh, probably a bunch of you who follow that, that account is very famous. Um, and he shoots beautiful video. Uh, and fun fact about this episode, I couldn't go to Italy where he's based to shoot this episode. So I had 
uh, a mentee of mine, a young filmmaker that studied here at NYU, also Italian, to go to Italy and shoot for me. And he called me a couple of days ago telling me that he won an Oscar. He won an Oscar for his short documentary with NYU. So like literally like it, it, that episode is shot by Oscar <laughs> award winner. <laughs> True story. <laughs> okay. Um, before moving on in how I actually made the series, how I organize it, how the whole creative you know, process work, I want to show you the trailer of this season. So you kind of like get a little bit of idea of the content that is in this season. Here we go. Back to representation. Okay. Yeah. So many people ask me, how do you find these people? <laughs> like, how do you actually pick uh, photographers for the show? So there's no like a one, you know, one specific way to do it. Some people I just uh, followed, you know, even before. Uh, some people I found through, um, you know, articles like, you know, a, a, like for Apple, for Michael with Petapixel, right? Like this, the controversial story of the AI that he created for the Cuba series. Um, I think it was, you know, worth talking to him. Also because in this case, it's not just, you know, a kid starting AI and just, you know, coming up with, you know, photos or pretending that those are photos. This is like an actual season. A photographer uh, that knows and loves photography, you know, uh, deeply, and decided to say, it's "Like, you know what? I think AI is a useful tool. Let me use it in a way that I think it's smart." Mm -hmm. So I think it would, you know, that's why I think I thought it was worth uh, reaching out to him. Like, you know, Summer I found it through Twitter because she's part of the whole Web3 movement and she sold a lot online, you know, NFTs and galleries. Uh, so definitely was worth talking to her. Uh, sometimes I just go on Google, you know, because I have to optimize my budget. If I'm shooting someone that is already in Chicago, I go online and I, you know, say it's like, okay, let me see who are the best photographers in Chicago. Let me see who is the most, like, you know, uh, you know, the best one for street photography or the best one, you know, depending if I want to kind of like balance out the series with a different style. Um, sometimes it's like a beautiful website, you know, I go, I know someone, I go to a web, to, you know, his or her website and the content is amazing. So it's just like, oh, I definitely want to talk to this person, right? And sometimes it's just like, you know, most of the time is Instagram. Like Instagram is the fastest way to kind of like see, okay, what are you about? Like, you know, what do you do? Uh, how good you are, you know, and that kind of stuff. Uh, of course, at the beginning, now it's season eight. At the beginning, season one, season two was also about like, you know, likes and followers, you know, because we wanted to kind of like get people, why do you, these people are liked so much? Like, you know, uh, now that I think algorithm and everything changed, I go towards more like, okay, this worth is like, this work is worth telling the story, right? So that's why, you know, so I go really like for like, you know, the story of the, the artist or like the actual quality of the work. So that's the research, that's that, what I do. The next step is emailing <laughs> these people, right? Like, and I'm not just emailing six people, I'm emailing like 30 you know, of them you know, for one season. So I just introduce myself, say it's like you know, where I'm from, uh, you know, that I'm not a bot, <laughs> it's not fake. It's like a real email from a real person. I send my personal you know, website, says like this is my work. 
you know, if you like what I do, this is the, the style that I shoot. Um, this is my channel. This is where I shot all the other 100 episodes that are already online. So it's not, it, it's a real thing. You can be one of these episodes. And usually attach, you know, in this case, like a little PDF um, with kind of like a very, like a synopsis, like something very short describing what the show is and where they can watch the playlist. The next step, organizing, you know, so as you can see, it's, I reach out to a lot of photographers, you know, probably, you know, in the green is the, the actual episode that I ended up doing, yellow people that says like, yes, I'm interested, but, you know, there's always something like the timing didn't work, you know, or uh, yeah, there are many, many things, right? Why these people that just don't reply? That also happens. <laughs> just like, you know, I try, I do like a second touch base as well. Uh, you can see, so I, I try to like, reach out because some of these people, maybe I really liked, you know, I really would have loved to shoot an episode. Maybe I'll do it in the next season, you know, or maybe some of these people are, have been there since season four <laughs> and there's no way to reach out to them somehow, right? Uh, and then of course, there's also like, you know, red people, so it's like people that just say no. No, for many reasons. It's like someone is in Russia. I can't go to Russia right now. You know, I would love to, but I can't go to Russia. Um, or budget. You know, yes, like you know, oh, I'll do it, but I want ten thousand dollars a day. I can't do that. <laughs> you know, like that's not the budget that I have. I would love to shoot with you. Uh, sometimes, I respond. You know, people honestly says like, you know, unfortunately, I don't have that budget. You know, uh, and people just say like, you know what? I like the work. I really would like to have this done for me, like the telling my story. I'll do it anyway. You know, anyway, I have few people also doing that. So it's all, always important, kind of like you know, be straightforward without being honest, and you know, don't be afraid to reach out. Then is once you know, people say, okay, uh, let's move on, let's do it. We book the day, you know, where, location. What are we gonna shoot? Like what kind of like, you know, uh, behind the scene you wanna shoot? You wanna do an actual fake shoot or you wanna actually be on an assignment at work and then I'm just gonna do the behind the scene. Uh, but the most important thing which gives the structure to the episode are the questions. The question for any documentary, right? Is what gives kind of like, you know, the blocks that you're gonna use to build uh, your documentary. So I send the same question to all the photographers or artists. Um, and then I say, once we are, you know, during the interview, once we are together, I'm gonna improvise and add few questions based on you, based on your particular style or other stuff like that. But these questions are usually what I ask all of them. And the structure is gonna be the same. And these questions are not random. Like even the order, you know, there is, there are, there is an idea behind. So most uh, artists, as I just said, they don't like to be in front of the camera. They're not, you know, <laughs> they, they don't want to talk. Especially when they feel the camera, even if they're talking to you and not straight to camera, uh, they feel the camera. So they're not natural, right? And, and that, you, that affects, you know, the, the, the interview and what they say a lot. Um, you know, and I know it because I'm one of those people, right? So the way that I do uh, this kind of work is I always try to organize the shoot after we do a breakfast, a lunch, or a dinner, something, right? So we actually get to know each other, you know? So I, you know, it's just like, okay, I'm gonna buy you lunch, I'm gonna buy you breakfast, let's chat, you know? And we chat about anything, could be sports, could be, doesn't matter. Uh, the thing is that we chat, so we create a rapport, a relationship. And after that, once we actually sit down with the interview, there is already a little, you know, warmth. It's kind of like, okay, we talked about it, you know? And this is not live, right? So we can stop, cut, and redo something. So it's not, it's not an issue. And the way that I start in the question, you can see is like, introduce yourself. Where are you from? Tell me about like, you know, uh, your city, where you were born, that kind of stuff. Because those are like the, relaxing question, because if you ask me where I'm from, that's easy. Even if I have a camera and I don't like being in front of the camera, I'm gonna start talking about like, you know, my family and you know, my, you know, that I'm Italian, I'm Sicilian, and I can, tell, you know, I can talk about Sicily for like the next two hours, no problem, right? So people are, you know, more comfortable talking about that kind of things. And then after that, I go into the next step, which is talk about your art, like your creative process, you know? Something that also we all love to talk about in general, right? So it's not, a problem, you know, it doesn't feel like an interview because if you talk about yourself and what you actually love, which is your, you know, your art, 
then everything, you know, it's a lot easier. So it's like I'm getting deeper, basically, deeper into them, who is in front of me. After that, it's time to geek out. Let's talk about the gear, like what do you use? So at that point, I think whoever is on the other side is warm enough to say it's like, yes, let's geek out. Let's talk about like, you know, my camera and my lenses. That's not a problem, you know, we can do at that point. After that, since you're like, you know, they're hot and steaming, they say it's like, oh, this interview is doing pretty, you know, it's doing pretty good. I, I thought it was going to be a lot harder, right? Then that's when I go deeper. So then we talk about like, you know, AI, we talk about, you know, people that, you know, everybody now is a photographer, right? Because everybody has a phone, so everybody has a photographer. So what do you think about that? So people can also start getting a little bit more confrontational and say things that are just, you know, it's their opinion, you know, which is always hard. Like if you start this as, give me your opinion about, you know, this thing, it's gonna be hard for them to like, you know, cold start, you know. So that's why I want them to be warm. It's like, okay, at that point, we already have, you know, we're deep into the conversation. Let's talk about something like this. Okay, gear. <laughs> so here are two photos of uh, an article that we did for 42 West, our Adorama blog, in 2016 for season two. And next is a photo that I posted a few months ago, um, in, in a, a few months ago for a job that I did also for Adorama, but that's basically kind of like the same backpack that I use for Through the Lens. You can see that many things are very similar, actually. So. The way that I work, it's all run and gun, one man crew, backpack, right? I don't go around with trolley bag, I don't, you know, I don't even check in. Like I actually want to bring everything with me on the plane, wherever I go. So for me, always like lightweight, the highest quality that I can get, but that it's lightweight that can fit in the backpack, that's what I wanna do. And that's why even though I have the access to RE, RED, and all like, you know, the high-end cinema camera, I always actually went for like something that is more so mirrorless in this case, you know. I'm a Sony user, so I go for like, you know, Sony camera. Uh, the Alpha 7S um, 3 is my go-to. And because it gives me like the highest quality, but that I can fit in my backpack, put three lenses, put a drone, put like tripods, and other stuff that I wanna have in my backpack, basically. And, and you know, that was 2016. I'm still, you know, today is still the way to go for me, right? I just upgraded, you know, from the first S, and now it's the S3, but it's the same kind of like setup, you know? Some things, of course, you know, improved, like the audio used to be, you know, the big, you know, transmitter receiver. Now it's this little thing right here, right, for audio. Uh, hard drives are smaller. <laughs> uh, I don't need external recorder anymore because the recording in camera, it's really like, you know, high enough. Um, so that's, I think, it's an important, you know, factor of my work. You know, often when I show up on set, people looked at all the episodes as like, oh, I thought it was going to be like a crew, you know, with lights and boom and, you know, and stuff like that. It's kind of like, no, it's always been just me with a backpack. <laughs> that's what I do. Most of the time is natural light, actually. I don't, you know, I bring with me nanolights, like small uh, light tubes, uh, but those are usually emergency lights. It's kind of like, okay, like this is like pitch dark. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. I need a light, right? Like I will use an iPhone, honestly, if I had to, uh, you know, but of course I try to get the best quality possible in the environment that I, that I am. But at the same time, and that's actually the next yeah, slide is adapting for me, you know, with through the lens, most of the time, I don't know what weather I'm going to get. I don't know uh, the location often because you know, people, you know, change their mind, <laughs> which they can, it's their episode, so they can change their mind the last second. It says like, you know what? I don't like that place anymore. Let's go over there. I say, okay, I don't even think about it. It's kind of like, tell me, you know, bring me where you want your episode to be and I'll, I'll do the best, you know, that I can in that, in that position, that location. Um, so you can see like, these are some of the interviews that I've done in, in Through the Lens. There's everything from like, you know, Banff National Park, uh, you know, sub-zero temperature <laughs> to like, you know, the beautiful north of Italy with the Alps, uh, you know, and every time I don't know what I'm gonna get. So I need to have gear that can kind of like, that is flexible enough for me to say it's like, no problem. 
I'll make it happen. In the, the, I don't have lights or it's super noisy because we are in the streets. We'll make it happen. You know, like some of the, the you know, uh, stories from this is um, the black and white on the top. For example, like this one right here. This was in Japan and was uh, Mr. 007 on Instagram. He actually told me that did not want to show his face. <laughs> and I was kind of like, okay, so you want to do an interview, but you don't want to show your face. It's kind of like, no, I'm sorry, I work for the government, I don't want to show my face, but at the same time, I want to do the episode. It's kind of like, hmm, okay, I'm going to do this. So creativity is kind of, you know what? I'm going to shoot you the whole episode from behind, kind of like, you know, Black Swan, uh, like behind his head, right? So him walking around Tokyo uh, only from the back. And then I'm going to shoot you just like behind your camera, which honestly, you're a photographer, that's what you do. Like, you know, you, don't, you never show your face, not even on Instagram. It's all black and white, beautiful black and white photos. I'm gonna do the episode in black and white, and it's gonna be mysterious like your feed, basically, right? So that's always kind of like, always, always try to also mimic kind of like the vibe of the photographer, right? So it's not about me, filmmaker, it's about you, uh, you know, photographer, artist. The episode is about you. Um, and there are many episodes where I had to adapt, you know, like uh, uh, Lee Lane here on the right is in Hong Kong, is the famous market uh, in the background. Uh, you know, there, there was no way to get this shot, so the only way was to actually walk up inside a parking lot. So go to the fourth floor of the parking lot, right, and stay basically by, you know, uh, the side of the parking lot between cars, and to actually get that background of the Hong Kong market you know, behind her, but at the same time, okay, we got the shot, but at the same time, we're in Hong Kong. Like, it's humid, super hot, and super noisy. It's like, you know, all the, the cars, it, it was crazy. So at that point, you had to like, you know, move the microphone in a different way and try to kind of like create something with the car that it, you're covered enough, you know, to, to not be too noisy that is not, you know, uh, unusable, the sound. Because of course, if the sound is unusable, that's it. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, you know, but your episode is not going to go live because unless I do a, like a music video, <laughs> that, that's it. Uh, I, I need the audio, right? And, and, and those were the years where we didn't have AI because now with AI, you can clean the background noise. So even if it's noisy, you can tell your software, clean the background, you know, clean all the noise with one click. Like, you know, but, you know, a few years ago when I shot that video, it was impossible. It was like you should go to like audio editing software and, you know, probably like, you know, play for like six hours to actually clean, you know, uh, an audio track. It was, and even after you did that, it still wasn't good. <laughs> oh, yeah, Brad. <laughs> I wish, I wish. Banff National Park, beautiful. Yeah, Brad is asking, you know, come back to Calgary. <laughs> Lunch is on me. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> Banff National Park, by the way, if you've never been, is incredible. It's so beautiful. Such a beautiful park. It's, uh, and we went in the winter where it was very cold, so there was no one there. Canada? So, uh, yeah, Canada. Yeah, like, you know, driving with, like, elk passing through. Uh, you know, everything is, like, you know, frozen. So you got waterfalls that are frozen. It was crazy. Like, very cold to shoot. So if you do it, you know, I think I did the right move of putting uh, hand warmers inside my gloves. So that especially when you're walk, you know, uh, um, walking with your camera, your hands you know, can stay warm. So you still have feeling <laughs> so you can touch yeah. you, you know, you your stuff. You yeah, no, I keep it actually, yeah, yeah. Um, usually it's when it's super hot, then it's super cold when you have problem with gear most of the time. You know, you can overheat, which is a lot, you know, it's more common than actually being too cold for the gear to work. Uh, the problem you can have when it's too cold is a battery. Battery can run, you know, even if you have in your pocket, you can lose the charge. So what I did is I put a, um, a hand warmer in my pocket with the batteries. So the, the batteries were kind of like staying warm, right? So I had that, I had like, you know, feet warmer, <laughs> I had a chest warmer. So I was fine, I was fine during the day. But you know, when it's like super cold in Canada, you, 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 you want to be ready. Question, yes? Um, the, the individual with the, um, from Japan, yes. Um, did you get to some place that you needed something else 
but since you know of the remoteness, you couldn't get it. Um, so the question is, um, the thumbnail from Japan, the one on the top left, if it was the challenging, and also with my backpack, if there were moments where I had to bring more gear, I guess, because the backpack was not enough. Yeah. So the first is, no, actually, that was one of the most fun <laughs> episodes that I ever did. Because you know, I, uh, traveling to Japan, I organized the whole season in Japan. So it, all the episodes are shot there. So I uh, optimized the budget. So it made sense to pay the money for the long trip, right? But then once I'm there, I optimize the budget to shoot a, you know, many different episodes with Japanese artists. And in this case, he was shooting um, this festival that was uh, in this Edo village, like a medieval uh, Japanese village uh, that is actually used for like uh, movies. That's what they may call the movies, like you know, the, the Edo movies with the samurais and stuff like that. They're shot in that village. So he was doing a festival with people over there, so shooting kind of like the, the, the behind the scene of that festival. And he says like, you know what, just come and shoot me shooting you know, <laughs> the, the festival, and it's gonna be great because it's gonna look awesome. You know, we're gonna have samurais, we're gonna have people with like, you know, yukata, and, and it's gonna be very you know, traditional Japanese. Um, and it worked perfectly. You know, we, we showed up a few hours before the actual festival, so we had time to do the interview and to get some like, you know, B-roll of him working. So that was not hard, but the hardest, I would say, Hardest sometimes is for uh, location because maybe the location is like very noisy or bad lighting and you have to make it you know, work no matter how. Sometimes is, I'm not gonna say who in these thumbnails, but one of, the <laughs> one of the photographers in these thumbnails, the interview was almost two hours. Not because it was you know, very talkative, because he just was, very, you know, was having a very hard time talking. It was like it was stopping every few seconds. It was kind of like, Saying a sentence and interrupting half sentence like, I don't know if I can do it, you know, was that, that type of stuff. So I try all the tricks, you know, uh, to, you know, make him think comfortable and stuff like that. And it, but it was very, very hard. So what I did in the end is two hours interview ended up being a four minutes episode. Uh, because I had to, you know, in the edit, and I'll show you how I do it, you know, very soon put together sentences for him, right? So taking from minute two and minute eight of the interview and making a sentence and then using a lot of the B-roll and his beautiful actually photography to cover, you know? So you don't actually see him having issues with the interview. Actually at the end, it sounds like he didn't have any problem with the interview. It was just nice and, you know, with a nice flow, right? The whole episode, but that's all editing. That's the magic of editing, right? And there was a, that was a very hard, you know, both while shooting there and also in the edit. It was a very long edit to do. So then your, so then your, your maximum time you're looking at um, for interviewing is roughly two hours. So you're, are you there, like, like so, when you go to this, are you there for like, you know, maybe two, three days or? No, the question is how long I'm there with them and for the interview. Average, 30 minutes. The average interview is 30 minutes. I always, when I talk to people the first time, it's like, I usually need 30 minutes, around 30 minutes for the interview, and around 30, 40 minutes for the B-roll to shoot you working. You know, once I have that, I know that I can do the episode. That's usually what I say. But sometimes people tell me, you know what? I'm going to Banff National Park. I'm not gonna stay one hour there, right? So, you know, we're gonna meet up, we're gonna drive there, we're gonna stay there a few hours then come back and then maybe shoot something else, uh, you know, at his apartment, right? Like working on the laptop or doing other things. Um, so sometimes I spend one day, two days with someone. The, I think the fastest episode that I ever shot was uh, 45 minutes, the whole episode. Like literally meeting someone, doing a 20 minutes interview, 20 minutes uh, B-roll of this person like shooting around, done. You know, it was actually here in Washington Square Park. 45 minutes, the whole episode was done. So, and sometimes two days, because we were doing multiple things. Like for example, uh, here, the other one in Japan, uh, in the temples, uh, we, you know, I spent two days with him, because we did like uh, the bamboo forest and the temples you know, in his episodes. So he shot with the model in two different locations. So we did one day one location, the second day the other location. But I, at that point, I thought it was worth doing two days, dedicating two days, because there were, there were two beautiful locations that I really wanted to do. So, so your subject knows the time frame? That, yeah. That you 
usually they are the one deciding the time frame for me. Uh, like I don't impose, like I only ask for those 40, 45 minutes, right? Then it's up to them, so it's like, you know what, just come, we'll spend a few hours together, right? Or like, no, no, spend the full day with me to do this, you know, right? And in that case, I organize my time, in a, you know, based on the photographer. Like I usually don't dictate the, the, the time. I only ask for the minimum amount of time that I need to make the episode happen, basically. Okay, post-production, and for this, I'm actually going to show you directly here. So, for a decade, I was uh, Adobe Premiere editor, uh, and a few months ago, I decided to switch to DaVinci, and so far, I'm very happy about the decision. Uh, for many reasons, if you want, I'll tell you. But uh, for now, let's say like DaVinci is working very well for me. Uh, I was using DaVinci for color correction uh, before that because DaVinci was born as a color correction software, very powerful uh, color correction software. And then they started implementing all the other features, including editing. Uh, and now it's a very powerful tool. Um, also, you know, for many people, it's free to use. There is a free version that you can use. Actually, yeah, <laughs> it's a free version, uh, and then you can buy the, you know, the full version that allows you to do 4K and more uh, features uh, in the full version. Um, but here, I just want to quickly show you kind of like the workflow uh, that I use when I edit an episode, right? So the first thing is organizing your footage, right? So you have. Uh, the assets from the photographer. So I always, you know, reach out to the photographer, to the artist. It's like, send me whatever you want. You know, send me like usually 15 to 20 of your photos, uh, some behind the scene if you have it. You know, it's a documentary, so I'm finding using uh, stuff from your past. It doesn't matter to me, right? Uh, screen recording, maybe screen recording of you working uh, on something. Uh, you know, some of your video work in this case. This is like the. This is actually the first episode. Uh, G Monk is gonna be the one going live on Friday. This is the, the timeline of the first episode that you see right now. These are all the cuts that I do uh, in the episodes. Um, so I got, then I have the footage, which is actually the one that I shot. This is the stuff that I shot at his apartment, uh, you know, working with the gear. I usually always shoot a little bit of a personal space because that helps you tell the story of, of the people. So, you know, some of the decoration on the wall, uh, you know, the books, uh, a little bit of working on uh, computers, you know, like anything can, can work for, for B-roll. Uh, usually it's just like, you know, people at work. That's what I want to do. And that's kind of like the story. Then they sell me all their projects, their photo, their videos, and of course, like all the assets. So in this case, it's like the Adorama intro and opener and all that stuff. Then, you know, what I do. So these are the sequences. The first thing that I do is the interview. So this is where everything starts. So this that you see here, all the blue stuff, this is in the interview, right? So I lay down the whole interview, which could be 30 minutes, 40 minutes, one hour, doesn't matter, right? And I start cutting it. So I start cutting all the good sound bites. So all the stuff that actually says like, this could be good for the episodes, right? So usually once you do that, like in this case, you end up having this is from, from zero to 25 minutes. <laughs> so he probably talked for around like 50 minutes, I would say, and I cut down 25 good minutes. So he's a very good speaker, right? Because having 25 minutes of good content, that's a good speaker. That's someone that you know, knows, you know, uh, has a lot of good things to talk about, right? But of course, the episode, usually I want it to be between five and 10. And so the, this 25 need to go down to five. So once I you know, cut the 25, I bring it to another sequence and I started cutting down to what I think is like the, you know, the best sound bites. Not just the good, I want the best sound bites. Uh, but this is the way that, you know, that I work when I do the interview. So you see all the, the waves. This is all basically him talking. Let's see if you can hear. The Windows desktop. The Windows 10 desktop is like, you know, that, that, that image is one of the most recognized images. You can ever. see the the holes is when, is when it takes image breaks, is, is when he's talking breaks, right? So often when I have so much to go through, I use the breaks and I know that that's where the cut is. And the cut will come out clean just because I'm using all the breaks between the sound waves, right? 
So instead of like just listening and stopping the bar at the right time, I just go and, and, and cut in, a, in, the, in the actual hole in the sound wave. That's a way to kind of like go quicker when you're doing you know, video editing right there, right? And we thought it was just going to be a wallpaper shipping with Windows 10. Sometimes also this is useful also for the, um, mm, mm, you know, uh, you know, everybody does that, right? Like many, and some people more than others, of course, but you don't want that to be in the episode, right? You know, one of people's like, um, mm, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure about this, right? So a lot of the work is just cleaning up, cleaning up the, all the um, the um, the, uh, you know, the, the pauses. So when you watch the episode, it sounds like a nice, cohesive, you know, you know, fluid, <laughs> you know, uh, conversation, like, a, you know, someone doing a, a keynote event type of thing. So that's what I want. So once I have this, I bring everything into my edit one. So my first version of the edit. So in this case, you see all the, the, the turquoise or light blue uh, is the interview underneath. And I cut it down to eight minutes. So you can see here, these are the, uh, the, the, count, you know, the timing, eight minutes. And you see that all this like colorful stuff on the top. What is that? My second step is the B-roll. So I make a sequence just to go through all the photos, the videos that the photographer artist sent to me, right? And I select what I think looks good, what I think has like a, a, a nice um, motion or it's like a good moment. And I know that those I can use in the actual episodes. So once I have this, I go back into my edit, I listen to what it's saying, and then I go into the B-roll and I put down what it makes sense for what, it, for what the person is saying. So if he's talking about, oh, I love to, to use uh, lasers, let's say. Yeah. I know in these episodes, it talks about like using lasers. Diopters, lenses, distortions. And, and so I know in that, that case, transcend. I use footage that has lasers, you know, and distortion and stuff like that, right? And, and then I go back to him a little bit for a few seconds. Spectrum, seeing and then go back to his work, right? Then he talks about like, you know, infrared and, and, and this kind of uh, work. And, and you see like the colors are very useful for me because they tell me exactly, even without zooming in into a clip, they tell me what it is. So I know the yellows, are all his, uh, it's his work. The blues are all the stuff that I shot at his apartment, you know? The other color is his interview. So even when I move, a, I wanna move stuff around, I know exactly what it is, even if I'm zoom out like now. So I don't need to like go back in, I can just go back out and just move stuff around because I know exactly what they are. And sometimes it's useful because maybe in the edit you leave few frames here, you know? Uh, from something, and if it's a different color, you will see it. It says like, oh, <laughs> what happened here? Let me clean it up, right? Uh, oh, this, by the way, is like the Tron stuff that he did. Uh, I told you before. In a like feature the, film called Tron Legacy. That was stuff that he did. That he was, was back in 2010. It was, you know, motion design was kind of at its height, uh, you know, in terms of its explosion. It was... Okay. Then once everything is done, I put, let's say, edit two. Everything is done, so I had to add all the graphics. I did all the Adorama TV stuff. Uh, you know, I make it nice and ready for, uh, for YouTube. And then I go and I go to the export and I export it, you know. Um, another thing that we've been doing for the last few years, I would say, is vertical. So I also have a timeline for vertical cuts. So you see here. I had to do the whole episode, I do vertical cuts. Now because it's a different computer is doing this weird thing with the bars, it doesn't matter. But uh, I basically go and cut like teasers and trailers and I take the, the best sound bites that we use for YouTube shorts and uh, TikTok and all the other stuff. And, and I do vertical cuts of the, each episode. Uh, this is something that you know, if you do video for clients, Often now you have to do that as well. It's not just the actual video. You gotta do all the social cuts. And this is something that I do here as well. Okay, and with that said, we are at the end of the presentation. So thank you. I'm gonna open it to questions if you have. I did not 
actually follow the chat. Sorry, guys, online. But <laughs> while I'm on this, I'm going to put some B-roll in the background. Uh, season 8. OK, this is actually all B-roll from the new season. And yes, questions. Discipline has come and perfected over that period of time. Um, like, how long are you? You were thinking that you know, should someone want to start it out? You know, the time frame, as well as um, the second question: Did you ever go to to do a particular interview and find that this is not what the guy or the gal portrayed themselves to be? and you wanted to like pull out of it. <laughs> OK, so I repeat the question. One is about um, discipline, like especially in post-production, I would say, but in general in the work. Um, and the other is that I wanted to pull out from an episode after you know, I, meet, I, I met the, the yeah, artist, I guess. The breakfast or lunch or dinner. Yeah, OK. So uh, the first one, discipline. Yes, uh, I started uh, this job in 2006. So I'm bad in math, but it's been a while. <laughs> um, so definitely experience, but also like, especially in the editing, if you're a messy uh, or disorganized editor, you can still bring the job home. You're just gonna be slower. There's no way that you can do it fast. You know what I mean? An organized editor is a fast editor. Because organizing folders, um, you know, the footage in a way that you know exactly where to go and find the stuff and, and, and putting on the timeline, that saves time. So it's really about speed. You know, you can still do it. You can still find things in your, you know, on your hard drive and stuff like that, even if you're disorganized, right? Uh, it's just lower, and you cannot work with other people. <laughs> because let's say if you're making movies or productions where you're not just the only person touching the art drive and the project, you're working with like a colorist, you're working with like a DP that needs to go through uh, you know, your dailies and whatever you're doing, uh, you need to be organized. Because people need to be able to uh, intuitively just like say, say, okay, I'm gonna go and see all the footage from this day. You know, and they can easily find it because it's labeled and it's organized. So that's the professional way to do it. Uh, but if you're, you know, a fast editor and everything is by, you know, by yourself, nobody will touch your stuff. You can do it as it is. You know, you can come up with your own way to to organize a project. Um, and the same thing, you know. Yes, I do also like the pre-production and all that stuff. So organization is essential. Uh, because you get a lot of stuff lost, and also work for a company, so I need to like organize all the you know the receipts and all this you know uh, you know the, the trips that I that I go and all the, the budget and all that stuff. So definitely, it, it's important to have that type of organization, and experience helps. Um, for the second question about if I ever wanted to <laughs> pull out after meeting someone, not really, because usually I spend a lot of time researching, because even after. Sometimes happen that I reach out to someone that I like their work, they will reply in a way that I didn't like. I usually give an extra email of kind of like says, you know, let's see if just, you know, it came out abruptly or it came out like, you know, wrong, the email that you sent back. But if I understand that that person is not easy to work with, like nobody's forcing me to work with this person, right? So I just move on. <laughs> so that happened. It never happened that I showed up on set, like, you know, at someone's home, and, and they were horrible. <laughs> that luckily never happened. It happened a couple of times that maybe their work, let's say, was a lot more fun than them as a, as a person. That can happen, right? But usually in my mind, while I'm doing the interview, even if the interview is boring, in my mind is like, I'll make it work. Like, I'll tweak the edit in a way that is going to be fun. <laughs> I'm not going to you know, portray this person as boring and talking slowly and not having an interesting thing to say, right? So it's just like, you know what? Your work speaks for you. It's beautiful. I'm going to make it all about your work and less about like 
the stuff that you say, right? So I'm gonna maybe use more music with, the, you know, with beautiful images from your work and less you talking, maybe, you know? Uh, that's another option. So, you know, of course, I always want people to look best in my episodes. I don't want anybody to, you know, to look bad. So, um, and, and luckily nobody was like <laughs> horrible enough to say, it's like, you know what? I'll go away. <laughs> I spent the money to come here, but you're not worth it. No, luckily never happened that. Uh, I usually try to cut that in the email process, like in the back and forth emails. Okay. Uh, sorry, guys at home. A few questions from home. Oh, Brad, you're like <laughs> hot streak from. <laughs> it's like a deep chat. Yes, here. Yeah, um, not to ask this great question because I'm like 72 at home. I don't put myself out there more as a filmmaker mm -hmm. and photographer because um, I have, I did short films on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And um, just try to put up. It's funny because um, I tried to bet you I download it. <laughs> it was for free, but to my, Microsoft is weird. It's mm -hmm. like they, they're very biased. If it's not Photoshop or Adobe, they, they, won't, they won't accept my, the program. Um, I did Movavo. Yeah, they, they do Movavo. I like Movavo, but it's, it's it's a lot of tricks. Like They'll give you free, but then, oh, um, you got to pay more just to get rid of the, the, um, the watermark, which I, I can't stand. They, mm -hmm. they, they, they want, if you want presets, if you want, you, you got to pay more. It's like they, 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 mm -hmm. extort, like they extort things that... Like, like legal this is all for editing, right? Yes. So, okay. Uh, so the question for the people at home is about like software for editing to start out and stuff like that. So you don't need like big software, like big deep software with a lot of effects to start out, right? Like I started with Windows Movie Maker. <laughs> so it's like, you know, the basic uh, editing software on the Windows 95, I think it was, or something like that. <laughs> and I used to like, you know, cut like Michael Jackson music videos. I used to like, you know, take Michael Jackson music video and recut it with different music, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's how I learned editing. Like that's literally how I learned like uh, the, the basic of editing. Uh, that's how I started. Then I started having like my little first camera, mini DV camera, and, and making music videos with friends and started editing my footage instead of like, you know, other, you know, people's footage. So the software is not important, you know, as long as it works on your computer, right? Um, as far as I know, the basic DaVinci works pretty well uh, as long as you have a decent enough chip on your computer. Uh, so I'm not talking about just the latest, you know, MacBook, but even the stuff from a few years ago still can run smoothly. Um, if the footage for some reason is high enough, uh, let's say if you use like a modern camera that has like 4K big footage and it runs low, in that case, do proxies. Do you know what proxies are? So proxies are any software, editing software you can do on the file, make proxies. Make pro proxies are basically the copy, like a, a copy of your file, but in lower resolution. So that what the software will do is that it will make you work with the lower resolution while you're editing, right? Because it's going to be faster because it's just less, you know, you know, file less sides to work with for the for the pro, uh, for your chip. And then once you're done and you want to export automatically, it will use the original footage, so the high quality. So that's a way to make the whole process a lot faster, right? So especially with big 4K files and stuff like that, if you do proxies uh, it's going to go super fast. It doesn't matter. Even from laptops from 10 years ago, you can, you can, you can work. So I told Brett and um, Mateo, I shoot with a, um, this, a quote, unquote, consumer camera, um, this, the Canon um, Vixia, Vixia um, G2. Yeah, yeah. And it, it gives you it's that. It's like it shoots that whole, like, like yeah, home camera footage. I mean, even with the mobile edit, it looks decent for YouTube, but I want that cinematic look I was mentioning earlier. Cinematic look is not just the sensor, the camera arm actually is, often is the lenses. So often I say, you know, people say like, you know, gear, about gear, the camera, oh, but you're using, you know, the red, that is $25,000 or that kind of stuff like that. It's, yes, like the camera will definitely give you a different flavor, a different, like, you know, quality in your image. But also, cameras are now getting old every year. Like every year there is an, you know, every brand has a new camera, right? Something that is not getting old are lenses. Like for example, my favorite lens is not here, but my favorite lens is a, uh, it's a Leica. It's, a, it's an old manual Leica lens that is like this, you know, it's a Summilux. It's a lens from the 40s, 30s, I don't know, 50s, 
1960s. Yes. Okay, it's a very old lens, um, you know, fully manual, so nothing automatic in it, right? But it looks beautiful, right? Because it's, it was done the right way. <laughs> like the glass that is in it is high quality, right? So when you have good glass, uh, you know, even if it's from 20 years ago, it's gonna make you look good. You know, it doesn't matter what you know camera you have behind, the lens will do a lot of the job for you, especially for that cinematic feel, right? So you want that depth of field, you want you know that creamy uh, background, and that lenses will do that for you. Then of course, the better camera you can afford to get, also the image is gonna change, the resolution is gonna change, you know, the, the, the depth of the color is gonna change, that's the camera. But lenses are definitely, for me, the best investment, also because it's gonna last. You know, like you invest in one system, Sony, Nikon, Canon, you know, whatever, right? Uh, and by you invest in lenses. Camera will change, and when, once you, you buy the camera, you have to think, I'm gonna use this camera for the next three years. So it better be a good one, right? It, it better, I'm gonna go for one that I know the technology-wise is gonna last me for a while. That's usually how most people think. You know, if you can afford a new camera every year, go for it <laughs> like that's the best thing that you can do right but if you cannot like you know most people in general like you know i did for for a long time i say it's like okay this camera that is coming out i see the specs i want it and i know that i'm gonna have it for three four years and it's gonna get paid by you know my clients because i'm gonna use it for work and, and all this stuff so it's an investment that makes sense to me that's 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 the way that you know the, that's not because i mean it though yeah how to obtain more clients like oh because I have potential clients, but you know, just like it's the, it's the whole flimsy, oh yeah, well, let's do lunch type of deal. Like, yeah, I'm getting so enough online? Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Talk. I didn't sorry. see any of the questions online. I don't know if you saw, no, saw, saw that. I'm sorry. Just I'm, I'm not a YouTuber, guys. <laughs> I can't, like, you know, look in my eye, <laughs> the, the chat. You, just, you, know, you sign off? Hmm? Okay, I'm going to sign off online. Thank you so much for watching. If you wanna, if you if you want more of this, reach out on my social media. Don't ask Adorama for more of these workshops because I don't like to do this. <laughs> you <get> more, <laughs> more. <laughs> but you know, thanks so much. Uh, you know, have a good night for East Coast and everybody else. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Good night and good luck. <laughs>